Thank you both for being here. Um, so I have to start with a confession, uh, which is that when I think about your companies, IBM and Bank of America, I don't necessarily see them as a huge draw for sort of like your edgy, entrepreneurial hacker types. Um, but I'm happy to hear if I am wrong. So what do you think, Ebony? I mean, I think that's a true challenge that companies of our size who, for, at least for Bank of America, who you know, are not thought of in that tech space um, is a true challenge. So we work really hard to make sure that when we are talking to external talent, which everyone in this room represents, right? When we're talking to individuals in the industry, um, whether it be new college graduates or experienced professionals, that we really showcase what it means to come to Bank of America, that there are those cloak and dagger type roles, okay. right, if you want that. Um, and there are also the roles of you want to code or whatever it is that you want to do that we can really represent all of the dreams and aspirations that you have for a career mm -hmm. at the bank. I mean, Deb, obviously I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit, but it's true that there are people out there, including probably people that you would want to hire at IBM, who think about working at a Fortune 100 company and they think, great, that's a place I'm going to probably have a stable career, I might have a long career, but maybe I'm not going to be really on the cutting edge of things. So knowing that those perceptions are out there, what is IBM doing to try to change that now? Well, it's a really different environment. I mean, it's unrecognizable. The IBM I know is a 100-year-old company that is completely reinventing itself all the time. We have a history of reinventing ourselves over and over again in the tech industry. We have tens of thousands of designers. We have 700,000 digital badges earned in the most current strategic skills. We provide a marketplace that allows every IBMer to constantly reskill themselves for the cutting edge skills that our clients are really after. I mean, honestly, people come to IBM because not only do they want to work on the most cutting edge technology, the highest patent earning company in the world, but also because they want to make a difference. Mm. They want to work on issues that really make a difference for the world. So that's what we're about at IBM. Great. And that matters a lot, particularly to millennials. I mean, is that something you hear from them that, you know, that idea of the purpose and making a difference is extremely important to their decision? We hear it from all IBMers, our mm -hmm. millennials, our experienced IBMers. You know, people come to IBM because they want to work on the most important innovation that's going to make a difference at IBM, at our clients, and for the world. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more broadly about the market for talent. Um, and I want to ask the room, uh, for those of you out there, put your hand up if you feel like you are operating in the most competitive talent environment right now of your career. OK, that is a significant amount. So you know, for Bank of America, I'm sure you're not just competing against financial institutions anymore. You're probably competing against Deb and IBM. Uh, you're competing against other big tech companies, startups. Uh, what does Bank of America do to make sure that you know, you're not just competing there, but you're actually winning? Yeah. And to that point, I mean, we compete with everyone, the entrepreneurs, right? For those who are just recent college grads who think, I want to start my own business, right? Oftentimes, those individuals are never even in the recruitment pipeline, right? We don't even see that talent. Um, and so recruiting with not only the banks, the small, the small shops, um, comp competing globally with companies that many of us have heard of and some that we haven't heard of. And I think um, for us, how we compete um, is really telling our story. We talk about the fact that not only is the technology that we deploy is exciting and new and innovative, but the people behind that technology too is really important. And I think oftentimes, you know, in this competition for talent, we, 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 we speak so often about the technology itself and it's so cool and great, come and experience this AI and come experience this around machine learning, but we can't forget the fact that the people are really the folks that you're going to be working with every single day really make the difference of whether you're saying yes or no or you want to be in that space. And so the use of our people to tell that talent story, um, we cannot take them out of the equation. And how we use them in our, in our advertisements, how we use them in our, in our campaigns, when you see a lot of the images that are external around Bank of America, 
those people who work for us on actual products, on actual solutions. And so to be able to see me in an image you know, on a brochure, you can actually say, hey, I want to connect with Ebony because you know, she actually works at Bank of America. So, so, so really using our people and leveraging their power to tell our story in a way that sometimes even the best marketers can't mm. do. Um, and on the, the tech front, particular, you, you mentioned that you are working on something to sort of build the technology pipeline directly into the bank. Yes, and so, that. I mean, I think for years, the conversation around technology and, and creating a whole STEM, you know, STEM strategy has really centered around the technology companies, right? So you've got Google, you've got IBM, you know, Cisco and, and others, and really, you know, we have to be a part of that conversation. So we talk about how do we take, you know, the eight large banks, you know, across you know, across the globe, or, or at least across the US, and how do we create a consortium to create FinTech, to, to create the next generation of individuals who want to be technologists within a financial um, firm, right? And so to be able to create the dialogue, the curriculum, and the strategy to, to be a part of those kind of eight organizations um, is, you know, is really exciting, and again, creating not only a current, but a future pipeline of talent into mm -hmm. the organization. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting insight that impacts IBMers as well. And what we're seeing um, is a real blending of yeah. skills and experiences. People are interested in innovative technology careers, but the opportunity to blend that with expertise and subject matter experience mm -hmm. is a powerful combination. And it really goes toward being able to make a difference that matters, a big purpose-driven part of the work as well. Um, Deb, I wanted to ask you about uh, the part of your job that involves sort of leadership selection um, and uh, also the training of leadership. Uh, during your time at IBM, how would you say that the skills to be a successful leader in the company have evolved? Well, I've been at IBM just a couple of years, and I've been really just amazed at the extent to which this leadership team role models the kind of learning agility and introspection and skills transformation that is needed to compete today. Mm -hmm. um, our leaders are based on sort of science-based assessments, figuring out their strengths and their developments and guiding their careers and their development accordingly, building really modern leadership skills and habits yeah. uh, based on be modern behavior science and, um, and also really you know, human-led processes. So you know, digital solutions and uh, analytics can drive and help to predict, but the human interaction and the commitment of time to identify, select, mentor, apprentice, and develop the pipeline behind is a critical part of our equation. I mean, I think when you, a lot of times when you think about training and um, e-learning, those types of things, you think about it as happen, happening maybe a little earlier in your career or in the middle of your career. So when leaders come to you, people on the executive side come to you and they say, hey, this new thing is happening, I need to learn more about it, like, what are they asking for? Can you talk specifically about a couple of those types of skills? Absolutely. So we're integrating analytics and digital learning into everything we do. We sort of have created a very robust internal learning environment that stems all the way from you know, digital solutions that give on-the-fly micro-learning and nudges to very robust immersive experiences. And a great way of thinking about it is it's not like we're sitting back holding topics that leaders come and ask for and we exchange knowledge. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're freeing up data and insights that leaders can explore and then find their own digital journey on those topics and then go deeper if they want to into immersive learning journeys. So an example would be uh, we are constantly sensing the environment for employee engagement. Okay. It can identify targeted issues that our leaders need to learn about. They can go to an engagement toolkit and figure out the right management and leadership mm -hmm. approaches to building it. If they want to go deeper, they can pick up an immersive class or a mentor or a coach who can help them practice that new skill. It's all integrated into a robust environment. Okay, great. Um, let's. Talk about where diversity and building that diverse team fits into this. Um, you know, we heard from Melody Hobson earlier talking about how companies have been talking about diversity for a long time, but you know, we all know that when you drill down and look at the numbers, the progress is basically incremental. Um, so, Ebony, tell me in your experience, um, what is holding companies and you know even Bank of America back when it comes to truly becoming more diverse? Yeah, you know, I think it's my own um, 
you know, opinion on that is really around execution, right? I think it's, you know, when I think about diverse pipelines and that, you know, we, we hear the conversation a lot and many of you express the competition for talent is, is, is increasingly fierce and it absolutely is. But I think about when we talk about the diversity of this, organ, of this country and we talk about the diversity that comes through the funnels of many of our organizations. And if you look at the data, the data is telling us that actually the diversity is in a lot of our funnels, it's, it's there. But how do we execute? How do we take actually that, that diversity that's there and actually do something with it? So, you know, I think about, you know, General McChrystal last night speaking at dinner and, and the use of his book around myths and reality. And so the myth is, is that there's a pipeline pipeline issue. Well, the reality is it's not a pipeline issue. It's really about how do I deploy the best resources, the best people, the best technology, right? Because I do think that technology plays a role in us figuring out how to execute on that diverse talent. But it absolutely is there. It's how do we actually get it through our funnel, through our organization? Um, how do we use the, the technology to, in some ways, eliminate some of the biases that we know we have? So we create some kind of tool or technology that eliminates that, knowing that there is still some bias in the technology based on the data that we use. But I do think that there are opportunities for us to um, use data and, and insights to actually understand better about our, our pipelines and our, and our funnels. And you know, going back to the point we made earlier around even our leaders upskilling, like you know, mm -hmm. we have a diverse, many of us have diverse pools already within our organizations. What are we doing with those pools to upskill them, to make sure that they are ready for the next role or for the next opportunity through infusing learning and or skill building within that current pool? So there are, there are solutions there. It's really about how we are really thinking about how to use those solutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Deb, I, I also think, when, you know, when we talk about diversity, you know, we, we want to talk about it, how it helps our businesses, right, and how it can help improve your products uh, and your technologies. So I'd be interested to hear about how you think about that at IBM, how, and particularly around AI, um, which we know is a technology that has the potential to either remove bias or add bias. Yes. Um, so talk about how that works at IBM. Yeah, absolutely. So we believe that diversity and inclusion are core elements of innovation for over 100 years. I mean, IBM has been leading the way in diversity, hired our first African-American and female employees in 1899, our first disabled employee in 1914, promoted our first woman to vice president in 1943. Female CEO. Female CEO, <laughs> which we're very proud of. Um, so, so we know, and it has been part of our DNA as a company, um, to support the idea that innovation and inclusion go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are constantly asking ourselves in every generation, what can we see today that we couldn't see before and what do we do about it? That brings me to AI. AI is an amazing capability for prediction. It helps us um, understand unintended consequences in our decision making that any individual manager or leader would have a hard time seeing because mm -hmm. their decisions are optimized in a very specific mm -hmm. and local way. So it can be a huge powerful tool. It can also encode unintended bias. So if the data set you're using is biased from its beginning or if the people making the technology are all from the same background or point of view, then you're going to miss the opportunity. And mm -hmm. I think this is a really important point for us as a, as a whole universe of companies today to be thinking about, you know, who's training your AI? What are their policies around your data? Mm -hmm. you know, how are they thinking about the ethics of what they're doing? I know at IBM, we know it matters who makes it. We're, that's why we're absolutely committed to diversity and inclusion in our innovation and in our technology. Yeah. And it's why we're working so hard to remove bias from our AI. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we think about, you know, again, um, the bias behind it and ensuring, like many of us, we've had conversations about responsible AI. And a part of responsible AI, in my opinion, is being responsible of knowing who's in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Who is in the conversation when you start talking about these policies and or building these solutions that, you know, that there is a diverse representation of thoughts and backgrounds, you know, actually at the table um, when this, you know, this new tool is, is actually deployed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I want to see if we have any conversation or any questions rather in the room uh, for our panelists. Sorry, I'm going to put my any questions out there. Okay. Um, 
here's a question that I have been wondering. Uh, talk a little bit about um, who is a person that you are very interested in now and recruiting heavily now at your companies that maybe you would not have looked at, let's say five or 10 years ago? Are there any skills or backgrounds that are now particularly interesting to you um, that, that maybe you would have looked over in the past? Well, we've had a massive transformation in my era. I'm responsible for leadership, learning, diversity and inclusion, and engagement for IBM. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the historical profile for someone in my space was someone with deep HR expertise, someone who uh, is a deep content expert in instructional design, and those skills are all still relevant. But today, I'm also hiring cloud architects, mm -hmm. data scientists. I need people who are really comfortable uh, carving technology, machine learning, carving technology paths, curating learning, as well as people with deep expertise in the core areas of diversity and inclusion, engagement, and leadership. And that's a hard mix to find. That's why we're turning increasingly to continuous learning uh, in order to build the skill set. And I'm really thrilled to say that our organization is becoming much more adept at coding their own chatbots and accessing the technology in a completely different way. Are there particular skills um, that, or technologies that you guys are doing more in-house training with now as opposed to hiring from outside? We've built a whole AI university. We're mm -hmm. deeply entrenched in identifying the right AI skills and bringing AI capability to our organization, uh, blockchain university, we have a Design Thinking Academy, Agile Coaching, um, really invested in building the culture, skills, and the you know, kind of capability for every IBM yeah. on the spaces. Yeah, very similar, right? I mean, we could run down the list. We're going head to head, right? As we think about the competition or the talent that we are looking for. And so when I think about attracting tech, you know, attracting talent, essentially what I do is, you know, face off uh, to external um, individuals around bringing, bringing that talent to the organization is how do we then differentiate ourselves between IBM, right? right? So we're looking for the same talent. So what is it about that makes Bank of America so unique and so special that would, that would say, hey, I want to actually go in and apply and or, um, you know, go work at, at B of A versus IBM. And so really, you know, head to head, same, same type of talent that we're looking for. It's really around how do we tell our story? How do we differentiate to say mm -hmm. that well, you your experience? you could come to IBM and work for Bank of America. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of cooperation that happening Absolutely. on this stage. <laughs> yeah. um, so, as people uh, go back to their companies here, everyone in this room is struggling with this question of how do we transform our companies, how do we transform our workforce. Um, I'd love it if you could each give one nugget that you think these, everyone should go back and go to their HR professionals and say, here, we need to check out this right now. Yeah. Um, I'm, my one nugget, I would say, is um, know what's coming ahead of you. You know, I always try to tell my, my clients is that, they always come to me when they, they have an opening and they're like, Ebony, I really want to make sure that I have a diverse slate, that I have, you know, really am considering diversity. And my point to them, it's, you know, that's really behind the curve. What I, what I want to have a conversation with you is six months when you're looking at your organization and you are thinking about what is it that you don't have, what is it that you don't, that you need, and we can start thinking about what is the profile, what are you, what are you looking for, and we can start to map out and or think about what talent is act, actually out there in the marketplace that's going to fit nicely into your team. So my advice to you is you're thinking about many of your organizations. Don't wait until it's upon you to start thinking about it, you know, going back to, to Melody's uh, comment this morning is like we're talking about it. So let's talk about it six months, even a year out. And so that gives us a long r runway um, or your, you know, the folks on your team, your recruiters, your, your L&D, you know, all these practitioners to help you um, come up with the best possible talent. So um, be as forward thinking as possible. Okay. And how about you, Deb? You know, we're really thinking a lot about resilience these days mm -hmm. and having a conversation with our wider organization about how to train for sustainable high performance and making sure that every IBMer has the learning agility and the focus and the you know, resilience skills to continue innovating decade after decade after decade. So I would look at the science on that. All right. Thank you both so much. Thank you.